Good morning, everyone. David Shapiro here. I um, I wanted to make a video about fine tuning with GPT-3. Um, at present, my most popular video is about fine tuning GPT-3 for a specific task. Um, but I wrote a post on the OpenAI community about just some tips and observations that I had about fine tuning, um, both from my own experiments, but from helping um, other people. So for instance, I've been approached by lots of people, uh, startups and students wanting to get help with fine tuning. And uh, you know, so, hey, I can just help everyone. Um, so let me give you five tips and misconceptions about fine tuning GPT-3. Um, my first tip is start with normal GPT-3 and prompt engineering. Um, get good with GPT-3 before you jump into fine tuning. GPT-3 is not like any other tool you've ever used, NLP or otherwise. Um, it's not like an SVM. It's not like a regression model. It's not even like other neural networks. Um, for instance, uh, a lot of people jump in thinking, uh, assuming that they need fine tuning when they haven't even used GPT-3 before. And I say, jump in, give it a test drive. It's way more powerful than you think it is. And so some people just, they have their, their old school data science mindset, like, oh, I need, I need a, you know, a data set. I need to, you know, come up with rules. And I'm like, just ask it. There was one case where, um, uh, a recent case where someone was trying to scrape dates from unstructured text. And I'm like, just ask for the dates. You don't need to fine tune anything. Um, pardon me. I'm a little bit parched. So I'll be drinking my tea while I talk. It's still too hot. Ow. Um, yeah, so jump into GPT-3. Plain vanilla GPT-3 is way more powerful than you think it is. Um, it knows a lot more. Uh, it's it's read, you know, many gigabytes or terabytes of text. I don't even know how much data it was trained on. I've seen different numbers. It depends on who you ask. Um, so it's not like anything else. When you, when you fine-tune GPT-3, that's actually transfer learning. Uh, which means you're getting the benefit of most of the learning that it's already got. Uh, so it doesn't work the way that you think it does unless you've read the papers and played with it. Um, let's see. Oh, another thing. Uh, this is one of this is a really big misconception is um, prompt engineering means you have to be really good at language. Uh, and it's really interesting. My partner and I, my partner is uh, getting her master's degree in information science. So she bridges the gap between humanities and computer science. Um, so if you work with philosophers, with writers, with digital humanities folks, they get it really fast. Why? Because they understand language. They understand rhetoric. They understand using the written word to communicate ideas. However, you put GPT-3 in front of a die-hard math-first computer science um, major, and they often can't see the language for the math. Um, another way of, of saying that is they, they see the algorithm first without seeing the implication of the language. Um, and it's really interesting to see that like some people put the language first and some people put the math first. So with GPT-3, you don't have to worry about the math. So if you came up um, from you know a, a hardcore you know computer science algorithmic thinking, um, that honestly won't help you with using GPT three. And uh, so some people ask me like, okay, well what 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 what? Uh, bleh, sorry, stuttering. Um, if you've watched some of my other videos, you know that I stutter sometimes. I don't even identify as a stutterer. It just happens sometimes. Everyone stutters. Anyways, sorry. Um, but I lost my train of thought. Oh yeah, team composition. Um, if you want to have a, a, a dynamite team using large language models, make sure that you've got someone who understands language on your team. Um, maybe hire a librarian, an English major, a philosopher. I was working with one startup for a while where um, they were uh, they all had they all had humanities training. Um, they understood philosophy. They understood all sorts of other uh, psychology. Um, psychologists get it really well too. Um, and they all, they understood it. I showed them what GPT-3 could do and they're like, this is amazing. And, and I see what you mean. Like this is capable of philosophical reasoning. Um, and of course, you know, you show a philosopher that a machine is capable of philosophical reasoning and they're blown away and you show a computer scientist and they're like, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> it's, it's just this really weird dichotomy. Um, so higher humanities. Um, uh, so that's, that's all, that's all within tip number one. 
Start with GPT-3 plain vanilla. Um, number two, tip number two, um, building fine tuning data sets is a hundred times more effort than prompt engineering. Um, for that reason alone, start with plain vanilla GPT-3. It'll carry you way farther than you think it will. Um, if you, if you take uh, GPT-3 to its limits, if you say, okay, I've worked with this tool for months and I can't get it to do what I need it to do, then maybe it's time for fine tuning. But even then, maybe not. I'll get into that in a second. Um, but yeah, like building fine tuning data sets, it's super, super hard. Um, let's see. Now, okay, let's assume that you've done your homework. Uh, you've decided, yes, I do need fine tuning. Um, my first tip is use natural language um, separators or demarcators to identify where the, the prompt begins and the uh, completion uh uh, prompt ends and the completion begins. Sorry. Um, in the OpenAI documentation, they just use like hashtag, hashtag, hashtag. And while that can work, it's semantically meaningless. So what I usually do is I will add like just a couple words. Like if um, in my uh, in my question generating um, uh, fine tuning data set, I have like here's you know a block of text. And then I say like ask questions, and then with a with a colon. And GPT three really learns. Okay, that's where the task begins. And so just like you know one to one to five words giving the instructions right at the end of the prompt that helps teach GPT three one what its task actually is without having to infer what the task is because then you can be very explicit about what its task is. Um, but also that it's more semantically meaningful. And the reason that semantic meaning is important is because if you tr if you fine tune a data set to do multiple tasks, it needs to differentiate between those tasks. Because like, let's say, let's say you're trained, you're fine tuning a chat bot, right? And you want to, you want to train this chat bot to ask questions or provide facts or, you know, answer questions. Um, so ask or answer questions, provide facts, um, or just whatever you need to be able to differentiate what you want your fine tuned model to do. And by, by using a natural language separator, that means that at inference time, when it's in production, you can actually switch tasks um, without, you, without having to switch between different um, fine tuned models. Um, and that will save you a lot of time because let's say you make uh, you know, one fine tuned data set that's got 200 samples of asking questions and 200 samples of answering questions. Now you've got one fine tuned model to use and you're ready to go. You're off to the races. Um, so natural language separators, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a really big one. Um, that's number three. Number four is use GPT-3 itself to make synthetic data sets. Uh, I use this quite extensively. GPT-3 is able to simulate any kind of conversation um, and so you can, you can either, you know, scrape web data, which is legal. There is another, um, uh, what was it? Ninth Dist district U S circuit court, um, just said like, yes, using scraped, uh, web data is perfectly legal. As long as it's pu publicly accessible, it's not hacking. It's not theft. If someone puts public uh, data on the internet, you're free to use it. Um, so I scrape Reddit, um, public Reddit, uh, as a way of getting kind of some raw material. Um, but then what you can do is, and oh, uh, check, check the description. I've got a public repo with all of my publicly available fine tuning data sets. Um, so you can go see what I'm talking about. Um, but by, by synthesizing a data set one, it's way easier. Um, you write a few good, really good prompts to say, to, to generate the kind of output that you want, the kind of input and output that you want. Um, and then you're off to the races. It takes me, you know, an hour flat to make a new fine tuning data set. Um, cause it's just, it's just a couple of scripts to, uh, take in some raw material, um, and massage those into, um, prompts, which the, uh, the latest instruct models instruct series of GPT three models are really great at generating synthetic output or synthetic data sets. Um, and then you're, you're ready to go. Um, so one thing that I need to say there though, is, um, going back to point one, fine tuning GPT three is not like conventional ML. Um, I, there was one person on the forum who thought that he needed 200,000 samples, um, to fine tune GPT three for a good chatbot. I said, no, you need 200, not 200,000, 200. 
and I, I did the numbers and I was like, this is like what a dollar, like if you, depending on the, the, the model you use, it's like 18 cents to fine tune with 200 samples. Um, I think if you use DaVinci, it's a dollar 80, right? So Curie can do most tasks. So you fine tune a Curie model, it'll be faster and cheaper, costs 18 cents to fine tune with 200 samples. Um, and that was like a high water mark. That's if you use a thousand tokens per training sample, which most of them are gonna be a 10th of that um, because, because of how aligned the models are now. Um, so you know, it takes way less data than you think to get started. And I, I proved my point. I gave, I, I, that's, that, that post is actually why I publicly posted my fine tuning data set. I said, go grab my chatbot um, fine tuning data and run it yourself if you don't believe me. And he went and he did, he said, this is impressive. He said, you know, there's still some problems, but it performs way better than I thought it would on just 200 samples. Um, so uh, yes, and I used GPT-3 to make the fine tuning set. And then I went and manually cleaned it up by hand. Um, that's way faster than doing a whole data set by hand. Um, number five, fine tuning tends to increase consistency at the cost of creativity. Um, sometimes that's what you need because GPT-3 on its own can be really creative, right? Um, GPT-3 is able to um, adopt any mental framework. You can tell it like pretend to be Yosemite Sam. That was Looney Tunes back in the day. That's dating myself. Um, it can pretend to be Bugs Bunny, Spider-Man. Um, you can talk to it about philosophy. You can talk to it about racism. Um, it can take the perspective of different religions, right? So G plain vanilla GPT-3 is really creative. It's more creative than any 10 humans. Um, so, but fine tuning, because you're gonna show it a bunch of data set uh, samples from a particular perspective, it'll kind of lose those other perspectives. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you're trying to do a creative task, prompt engineering is gonna be better than fine tuning. But if you, if you really do need consistency, and a lot of tasks do, I'm not saying that this is a bad thing, just something to be in, uh, keep in mind, is um, if, you want, if you want your GPT-3 app to be able to provide really creative answers or solutions, fine tuning is gonna reduce that ability. Um, whereas if you need something to be very consistent, um, like if there's a particular format to follow, that's where fine tuning really shines. So yeah, five tips for uh, five tips and misconceptions about GPT-3 and fine tuning. I hope you found this helpful. Thanks for watching. Oh, also like and subscribe.